What exactly happened in Benshine? Oh, right. This was in February? I think so. After I, the bulge. Yeah, it was after the bulge. Uh, we had been sent out, and uh, I was working with Mike. I may be wrong, but I think the 4th Armored was going down the main road. They was making that, and we was going off to the side to clear villages like we normally do, get, keep everything clear on the flank. And we came up to this little hill like that, and stopped. Oh, Mike motioned to me to come forward, so I dismounted and went up. And we looked out here, now say like midside was over here, the town. The road came down around this way and come into the town. And in this field down here, and there's a creek right here down below the, uh, this little bluff. In this field out here is Germans all over the place with their, their holes dug and everything, just walking around. They didn't even know we were there. So we figured, well, shoot. It's like most of the other towns, they got them out to protect the town. We called back for infantry and waited for about an hour and a half and they sent the infantry up. They sent 15 green infantry. Handlebar Hank, uh, I'll never know his name and I wish I knew it because bless his soul. Uh, he had a big handlebar mustache and his name was Hank and I, that's the reason we just called him Handlebar Hank. Uh, so uh, Mike says, well, again, you know, with all those down there and everything like that, he says, if I send jeeps or anything, anything can knock them out. He says, how about if you can lead out and go down the road, I'll fire from support here, and then I'll get support down to you right away, and then we'll fan out and go on into the town. Okay, fine. So we got all set, and I took off in my tanks and went over the hill, and we opened up on these guys here, and the infantry was supposed to, we gave them time to get around and get in position over here and with this ravine over here so they could sweep around this way and then protect me as I came over the hill uh -huh. We sailed over the hill and went around and opened fire over here like that. I went down this little dip and, and just went up and oh, just topped the rise here. And I was planning on, on stopping just, just beyond that rise and uh -huh. opening up. Well, right there is where I set off the mine. And of course it, it knocked our tank out so we dismounted, got behind the tank. There's a damn machine gun right over here, right straight ahead of us, firing us. But we all got behind the tank. And I hollered, send up my second tank. Well, the second tank, and that was Murphy in it, and I'll, I'll remember the others, got, uh, came up right in my tracks. And they got up, oh, probably, well, maybe twice as far as from here uh -huh. to the bush, from me and they roll across and all of a sudden there's a damnedest explosion. Well, later on we learned that what it was was the uh, Italian box mine. And what it does, it's a big box that goes across the road and then it's got two cutters. And when you roll across that, it cuts a wire and sets off the thing. Well, evidently, the tank just wasn't heavy enough, the light tank wasn't heavy enough to cut it completely. So when they rolled over, they cut it. Well, when that exploded, it blew the whole bottom of the tank in and uh, of course stopped the tank right away so I ran over and if you know the hatch was blown loose threw it up well the little driver uh, was slick was the driver I knew he was dead because he would just kind of slump forward like that you know and the whole back end of his head was gone mm. and you know his back was just you know shredded and I ran over and right here the little assistant driver uh, he couldn't stand up, so I grabbed him under the arms and pulled him up and just, you know, threw him over and then ran up. Well, Murphy was crawling out of the turret by that time, and I, I just helped him out, and Holt was trying to get out, and then, and then like a goddamn oh, fool. Oh, that was Holt was in that tank, too? I think it was. Okay. I'll have to check, uh, but it just seems to me that poor old Holt, that was the third time he was wounded but I know Murphy was in there. Now, how did you go into the tank? I didn't go in. I just wanted, I was run up on the front slope plate like that, uh -huh. see, and stood right there, like this is a hatch right yeah. here. And this is a driver. Uh -huh. I knew he was dead, so I just stepped over here, and here's a little bow, bow gunner. And I just grabbed him like this, and where do you get the strength? I don't know. But I pulled him up like that, and. His legs were broken, I don't know how many times, below the knees. Mm. And that's the reason he couldn't stand up to get out. 
And then I just ran up here, you know, and right here is Murphy, and helped him over, and then I saw Holt was getting out, and I'm pretty sure it was Holt. And then instead of jumping behind that tank, I turned around and ran back to my own tank, behind it. Well, Handlebar Hank had been, uh, he was laying uh, right here, say like this is my tank that was docked out here, the, the second one on the, he was right here and that explosion knocked the living daylights out of him and he just kind of jumped up and then fell over here on the road and this damn machine gun opened up and you saw that the tracers come by here like that that missed him and then the second time he came back it, it walked right up over his shoulder. Well now this, I can prove this, I ran back, got handlebar Hank, pulled him over here and got him over into the ditch between me and my tank, got him in there and then uh, we called for, uh, for artillery support because I knew we couldn't do a damn thing and we had, uh, uh, there's some two Germans right in here. And we knew they were right there, so you know, there's old Combs here, Mach Schnell, Mr. Hondi Ho, Odorish Schiesen. Uh -huh. We captured those two Germans. They, they came, came running, just probably from here, that bush came running over. So we called for artillery. Well, in the meantime, the Germans started throwing artillery in on us. And so I called back and said, send us help for support, you know, to get the wounded out. And. Uh, the uh, fences there, you know, is these little, uh, uh -huh. oh, just kind of like a pole fence. So what we did, we just, we'd reach up and grab those poles, put two down like that, and we took our coats off and our, our tanker jackets and run the sleeves through, and we made stretchers. And uh, I had to call back and had Pat to start backing up him and, uh, and his other tank. Shortle? Shortle, uh-huh, uh -huh, Pat. And I think Holmes was the one behind him and I had them back up and open fire to pin anything down here. And then we carried, we got everybody out of there that was wounded, including we made the two PWs help us carry them. And uh, the last time I saw Handlebar Hank, we, you know, radioed back to send medic up, and they sent a medic jeep up. And old Handlebar Hank was laying on a litter on this medic jeep, and he had a cigarette laying like, like this, hands all bloody and bloody up over, puffing, and he looked over at me and said, how are you, Handlebar? He says, I got me a million dollar wound, I'm going back to the States. But he must have been hit pretty badly. You know? Oh, he was hit bad, and that, see, we saw the puffs. When when he was laying there, you could see that the, the German just uh -huh. started in and just worked up. And it just, the first one, you know, missed him came right down like that and missed him over here. But that third one, he was kind of laying this way and I just mm. walked right over his shoulder. And then that explosion, Jesus, right beside the other. It, uh, but he survived? Uh, I don't know. See, I, I have no way of knowing because he was evacuated and I got on my, uh, on Shorto's tank and rode on the outside and we moved back. And then, uh, since I only had two tanks, uh, they sent the captain's tank up for the third, and then that's the next day where the second platoon moved around with infantry, and we went ahead and came in this way, went down the slope and came in, and uh, took the town. That's the time Zebarth, the old German, bang at him, shot, and Zebarth em emptied a whole clip, 250 rounds into that. <laughs> Foxhole, the little German stood up and smiled. <laughs> See, Bart says, oh shit, <laughs> back. <laughs> you know, I think somewhere I'd read but said he was about 70 yards away and that's a bunch of bull because that little guy wasn't any farther than here that bush and he just stood up and bang, you know. <laughs> Zeke was just getting ready to crawl on the darn tank, you know, because uh -huh. we'd come in this way and he'd come in this way. <laughs> he just reached over to his hack hack gun and <laughs> And you know, he just figured that guy just dead as hell, and then all of a sudden, camera. <laughs> <laughs>
That's when Zeke and I went up there and dropped it. No, it was Rota Rota we did that. Now what was Rota Rota? Oh, that was up on the Rhine. We had to go down this long call and go into Rota Rota, and that's where we found that big cellar uh -huh. of uh, what we called pink champagne. It was actually sparkling burgundy, but they had every kind of wine, gin, rum, everything. Not at Alton Wagons did, while we were safe to say that we came out of there with two cases on the back deck of each tank and all we could hold in the inside. <laughs> so he put out an order. When we were held up there in Ha for a while, right next to where we were trapped was a warehouse full of liquor. And when we got out of that, we let the old man know, and they sent a two and a half ton down there and loaded it up with liquor, and we figured that whenever we came in that we'd be able to have a big party. Well, the only time we ever got in and started to turn tracks and everything, we asked, well, how about some of that liquor that we we let you get? They had drunk it all. We didn't get one damn drop. And then the old man put out orders that had, that all liquor would be sent to the rear, that you would not carry liquor in the tanks. And good old boogity, the old man <laughs> came up one day, and Mike and I were studying the map, and the old man asked how things are going fine. And uh, he says, can I use your radio? Sure, you bet. He stepped up on the tank and goddamn, he delved in and looked down and there's Boogity just taking a drink out of a bottle and looking right at him. <laughs> and he goes up and reaches over to get my radio and looks down and right in the ready rack down there, there's a whole damn bunch of bottles of liquor. There was, uh, oh hell, I, there was no champagne at that time, but it was regular rum and, and regular liquor. And he came back up to me and he says, uh, I thought I put out an order about there'd be no more liquor in these vehicles. I said, Captain, I says, this is true. I says, this is right. He says, what's all that liquor doing in that? I says, Captain, we just came through that town and that's what we liberated. I says, I had no chance to get it back. I says, it's there. Now that you're here, why you can take it back. But I said, we wasn't gonna leave that there. I says, on your order, we understood the order was we weren't, you know, to keep liquor uh -huh. in our tanks. I said, but we just, we just, just captured that. What was Boogie doing, doing uh, taking a drink? I didn't know. I said, he must open one. I'll get a hold of him. I said, Captain, I'll take, I'll take care of that. And I said, Boogie, you silly shit. I said, you knew the old man was up here. Why in the hell did you take a drink? Well, damn it, I wanted one. <laughs> that was Boogie. <laughs> Now Slick, the driver who was killed, yeah. was that his last name or his nickname? No, that was his name. Yeah, Slick was a little, was a little driver. And Jesus, it just it took everything out. You know, his whole back end was gone. Hell, it, it, it blew the whole bottom of the tank in. Mm. It just, that Italian box mine, I don't know, it must have had enough TNT to blow a house up. You see, the funny thing is, and this is in the 90th book, my tank was sitting here like this, so they came up, and there was room enough to get around for a while, and so they just routed some traffic around it. And the back tank, which was back here, they had pulled it off to the side. They came up with minesweepers and swept everything around like that. Well, then they came up and pulled my tank back. The 12th vehicle that went through there was a Jeep with a, an army uh, reporter, or with the reporter in it, and the driver. Well, what, he hit a mine, and then they say it blew, it through, it blew him 300 feet. My tank had rolled up and uh, like on the sprocket where the, it comes up like that. We had set off this mine here. Had I rolled six inches further, I would have set off another mine, and it had probably blown the rest of the, the tank mm. bottom in. But because of that, right under there, they had gone around and missed that one mine and that 12th vehicle was the one that set it